ಶ್ರೀ ಸುರೇಶ್ ಅವರು ವೇದಿಕೆ ಮೇಲೆ ಬರಬೇಕು ಅಂತ ಕೇಳ್ಕೋತೀನಿ ಈಗ ತಾನೇ ಸುಶ್ರಾವ್ಯವಾಗಿ ಈ ಶಹನಾಯ ವಾದದಿಂದ ನಮ್ಮೆಲ್ಲ ತಡಿಸಿದ ಈ ಕಲಾವಿದರಿಗೆ ಭಾರತೀಯ ವಿದ್ಯಾಭವನ ಹಾಗೂ ಶ್ರೀ ಶ್ರೀ ಕ್ಷೇತ್ರ ಧರ್ಮಸ್ಥಳದ ಪರವಾಗಿ ನಾವು ಗೌರವಾರ್ಥವಾಗಿ ಈ ಶಾಲೆಯನ್ನು ಓದಿಸ್ತಾ ಇದ್ದೀವಿ a scientist of uh, 30 years experience who researches and teaches vedic astrology because it works with remarkable precision as well as offers compassionate insight into our lives with over 30 years experience dr foss travels all over the world spreading vedic vision dr andrew foss holds a phd in computing science from the university of alberta united states He is also an Oxford physics graduate and a certified Jaimini scholar, the highest professional certification in Vedic astrology. Dr. Foss is the founding president of the British Association of Vedic Astrology and editor of Bhava Journal of Gochara. Dr. Foss has imparted his immense knowledge in his eulogized book, high dimensional data mining where he has written about the concept of clustering in general for a better understanding of the text mining applications over to dr andrew first yes. all right so now we want to look at some viewpoints on nature and we can look at this from many points of view but for me it's there's a physics view of nature and there's a view from jyotish so physics as i mentioned yesterday used to have a very mechanical view of the world what we call classical physics and there was a time in the 19th century when the, all the physicists generally thought that they'd solved all the problems they understood gravity they understood this and that light and so forth and therefore they had understood the world and there was no place for god in it so this was the predominant concept in the 19th century and we're still living with it today however the physicists what they forgot to tell everybody was that they figured out for themselves they were wrong and having realized at the end of the century that they basically got it wrong they then had to desperately try and find another way of seeing and that's when they came up with quantum mechanics they just forgot to tell the governments and the education ministry and all that about them. so there were things that could not be explained without quantum mechanics and without einstein's theories so there's things about these theories like quantum theory is very difficult for physicists to understand but it's actually very simple for someone who has practiced yoga this is a striking thing so i'm going to explain a little about this then jyotish people think jyotish is some kind of uh, superstition or pseudo science but it's actually based on a very rational observation of nature the ancients they looked at the skies and they came up with certain profound principles and they made a science out of it so these are the two people i think are particularly important in what i want to say Satyendranath Bose uh, was an absolute genius and he looked at the work that people had done on quantum theory and he realized that there was a type of particle which needed a completely different understanding so it was called a boson after him he sent his paper to a, a journal in London who rejected it so he mailed it to Albert Einstein who realized it was totally brilliant and made sure that it got published and then einstein wrote some more papers you know developing the thought he developed a way of understanding wholeness next so there's a thing called a bose einstein condensate basically what it is is that these bosons have a, a quality of being able to join together in a ground state normally particles cannot be in the same state as another particle but this particular type of particle has this quality of harmony so if you have 
for example, a metal, and you have, a, say, a loop of this metal, and you cool it down enough, there's a point where all the electrons in the metal kind of join in this grand harmony, and they go from being millions of electrons to being basically a single wave. And if you start it going, it will continue going forever. It literally becomes immortal, that flow of current. And this is something which the classical physics said was impossible. But people saw it at the beginning of the 20th century, it was observed, and then they realized that absolute, the absolute, the infinite, or God, if we like, was accessible in the material world. It could be experienced. That was the proper understanding. But of course, you know, the physicists were just doing the mathematics. But the very brilliant ones like Albert Einstein, they had a deeply religious tendency because they had profound experiences of transcending. So they didn't have a problem with this. So you get qualities of immortality, infinity, all these things are showing up. And the thing is, what's happening is that those individual particles, when they join together, then they become just one particle. It's like a vast expansion. So there's this sense of going to infinity that also occurs. So it has obvious links with samadhi. Any physicist who's experienced samadhi has no problem understanding quantum mechanics. But the others, they admit they don't understand it because that's not what they experience. Okay? So now there's this thing of entanglement. Didn't mention this yesterday. So some of you may have heard. Who's heard the word entanglement? No? Okay. Anyway, it's becoming a very popular thing to discuss because it's, it's kind of become a forefront issue in physics. And the idea is that you can have two particles, you bring them close together, and because of quantum mechanics, they kind of lock into some uh, unified state. And then if you can separate them, you have to do it very carefully so they retain their connection. Then if something happens on this side, instantaneously the reverse, or effectively there's a reverse thing that happens on the other side. And this the apparent transmission of the signal from here to here happens instantaneously. Now this, uh, this was predicted right back at the beginning. Einstein uh, had realized that this would happen because his theory and the quantum theory predicted it. And he said it's, he couldn't understand. He called it spooky action at a distance. And he felt that somebody made a mistake in the mathematics. But it was found that there was no mistake. So this is something physicists are having great difficulty with, because how is it that information apparently goes from one place to another place instantly, when nothing is supposed to go faster than the speed of light? So the physicists are all scratching their heads. Right now, they're scratching their heads. But for us, it's not a problem. Because what's happening is that the thing, those two particles, when they come close together, they lock and become one thing. And then even though it appears like you're separating, what you're separating is just it's like a stretching. It's like you, you stuck two pieces of putty together, and now you're apparently pulling it apart, but there's some kind of something connecting them. You can't see anything, but as far as God is concerned, they're connected. And therefore, there is a wholeness which is joining those two spaces. They're not really two spaces. The wholeness is connecting. You know this term, Sarvavyapikesha? Yeah? They say of Lord Vishnu, Sarvavyapikesha. He's present everywhere. The wholeness is connecting everything, and it doesn't need to take light years to get from one part of the universe to another. And this is the theory, because once things are entangled or connected, they are no longer subject because they're no longer separate. Once the separation is gone, once the, sense of, once the actual duality is gone, then issues of time and space are no longer relevant. All those uh, laws about time and space are no longer relevant. 
So this is a, a mind-boggling concept. I'm sure in the few minutes I have, you know, I can't properly explain it to all of you. But you get the, you get the, there's something very important here. Now, they were doing some experiments on photosynthesis. You know, how plants turn light into energy. And they used ordinary chemistry and physics, and they said, this is impossible. The plant is doing too good a job. It can't do it. Because, you know, a solar cell maybe is 20% efficient. So it worked out maybe the plant could be, I don't know, 60% efficient. But it turned out it was 100% efficient. How is that possible? Entanglement. Quantum mechanics. It turns out that the plant is going into a quantum mechanical state where it can perfectly efficiently convert the energy into, uh, convert the light into energy. So then they realized that these big organic molecules could also function in these uh, sound of holistic states because all the, all the electrons floating around the DNA and other big molecules are somehow connected by virtue of being part of this one entity and its, you know, its own field. And so then, okay, so then they discovered that birds could see the magnetic field of the Earth by virtue of certain quantum mechanical effects in their eyes. They could literally see it. And they realized that they could use this, once a system was operating on this level, it could detect things which were just impossible for the ordinary physics and chemistry to explain. Extremely tiny changes in the environment could be detected, which should not be possible. So now the question is, how much more of what goes on in our heads and our bodies, it, and beyond that, is really a f this phenomenon? Because what physics is saying is that if you become relaxed enough, if you cool down the system, in other words, you, I mean, for a, a biological system, you don't have to make it very cold. You just have to make it quiet. So this is the whole yogic philosophy, right? You relax, you experience infinity. Hey, isn't it the same thing? Because those particles, those um, DNA molecules, proteins, and all those things, they're all close to each other. And they're connecting to the surface of the cells. The cells are connecting to other cells. So you could get a kind of ripple effect of the wholeness spreading out throughout the whole nervous system. Now, how about this? You go and visit some Guruji, some saint, and you're sitting in his presence or her presence, and you become very relaxed. So you're calming right down. Then she looks at you. She's completely quiet. Something happens. Entanglement. Because there's no, there's no reason why, you know, if there is some connection between two things, we can say, something will happen that makes them, to some degree, one. For example, you're just having, a, you're just sitting in your house, suddenly you think, I should talk to so-and-so, some relative or some... Next moment, the phone call comes. How, how many people have had this experience? Yeah, just about everybody. Right. So then, are you telepathic? We say telepathic is all superstition, right? Everybody experiences it. Many examples like that. You're walking along. I mean, you're standing there. And somebody else is standing there looking in the other direction. If you just look at them, look at the back of their head with enough, you know, focus, they'll turn around. Yes? How did they know that? How did they do that? Superstition? No. There's something going on. Exactly. The brain is not really isolated. What's going on inside here is not isolated in this little tiny space. It's radiating. And those waves will radiate, capable of, of uh, kind of connecting to other brains, other uh, living entities, even maybe unliving ent entities, which allow the possibility of a connection. 
So what is physics is finally catching up to explain these things. We all experience it. It's not like we know it doesn't exist. And the ancients, who were much more relaxed than we are, and they had a much calmer and less polluted environment, they lived like this. They didn't need mobile phone. If they need to speak to someone, the connection was there, right? Even the so-called primitive peoples, they can do these things because they're, they've attuned from an early age to make up for the lack of the telecommunications. Okay. <laughs> anyway, I spend a little time on that because I think it's interesting, right? All right. So now this, this table, I don't know if anyone's ever put this table up on the screen before, but it's actually phenomenally fantastic. I don't know if you all guys are getting these conference programs, but I wrote this uh, article, and I've explained... Behind, what's behind this table in some detail, and I don't have time to do it now. But basically, this is really the whole of physics. Uh, physics has five force fields which explain everything. Only five. You talk to the typical, you know, intellectual, and you say, what about the five elements? They say superstition. <laughs> so how come quantum mechanics tell us there's only five? And then when we look at those five, which explain everything in the universe, we find a perfect correlation with the five bhutas or tattvas described in the Vedic science. So I've, I've explained this in detail in the conference proceedings. And what you see on the right, which is the Vedic contribution, is what we call the srishti order, the order of creation. First akasha, then vayu. You, you know this srishti order? Yeah, some people do. Agni in the middle, I put it in, you'll see why I've colored it. Jala and Prithvi. This is how creation, according to the Puranas and all, this is how the creation came out. Hey, physics is telling us exactly the same thing. All right? So we'll come back to this. Uh, bear this in mind, okay? All right, this is my book. It's the, basically why I started this all in Karnataka, when I was in Kolor. And it's basically, I collected all the Ashtotra, Shatanama of the Grahas, and they did translation and commentary. Okay. Nobody's done it, so I thought somebody should do it. it took me a long time, but it's got it's done. So what is the use? So these mantras, actually very interesting, they give us understanding into ourselves because they relate to us, they have a lot to do with development of consciousness. They're very high energy, these mantras. And they help us understand more about Jyotish. Actually, you can do a chart reading just from the book without knowing any Jyotish. Then people say they're very soothing. After all, these mantras have been used for remedies by the Jyotishis in South India for hundreds of years. You can meditate on them. You can contemplate on the meanings and that may help you. Okay. Everyone knows about the Navagraha, right? So the lords of the weekdays and the lunar nodes. Each one has 108 mantras. Let's understand about 108. Okay. 108 is the basis of Jyotish. That's why it's called Sri. Huh? So why? Because the angels looked up at the sky and they saw 12... 12 uh, Purnamas every year. So they came up with the concept of the 12 signs related to those 12. And then they saw that the moon took 27 days to go round once. So they came up with the 27 nakshatras. So these are the two things. The sun is like the father and he has 12 signs. The moon is like the mother and she has 27 places. And now the father and the mother have to get together for there to be creation. Everything is numerology. How do we fix 12 to be the same as 27? And the short, simplest answer is 12 times 9 equals 27 times 4. Each nakshatra is divided into four padas. 
Each Rashi is divided into nine Navamshas. So both systems give us 108. So this 108-fold division is the basis of Jyotish. And what is it? The sun, the father and the mother, the sun and the moon coming together, creating everything. So that's why four is another number of the mother. Why is the fourth house the mother? Why is the ninth house the father? It's all in this little bit of numerology. You can, a lot of what is in Jyotish you can derive like this. Okay. So what this means is that 108 is very important and each one of those mantras is related to one part of the sky, one Navamsha or one Nakshatrapada. So that's why all the devas, all the de devis, all the grahas, they have sets of 108 names, Ashtotra, Shatanama. You all know that, right? But, so we've been chanting those names. But whoever thought, why don't we find out which one of those names is good for me particularly? My moon, my chandra, right? Where is it sitting? Which Navamsha? I can look up the mantra for that. I mean, it's kind of obvious when you hear it. But, you know, until my guru told me, I never thought of it. And nobody I ever met had thought of it either. <laughs>